Having disavowed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in March of 1964, Al-Hajj Malik Al-Shabazz was still that December in Oxford seeking to distinguish himself politically and religiously uh, from his expertly constructed media image as Minister Malcolm X uh, of the Nation of Islam, the national spokesman for the Nation of Islam, in fact. While well, his posthumously published autobiography uh, later asserted the structure, personalities, uh, and images that would coalesce into a standardized narrative of his life and career, premised on political growth and spiritual conversion, uh, he had also, during the spring and summer of 1964, uh, distinguished himself from the Malcolm X of old iconographically, even sartorially. On November 16th, uh, in Geneva, Malcolm wrote in his journal of his weariness and the threadbare state of his wardrobe, quote, I slept late, then went to buy an overcoat. I'm not very good at shopping for anything. By 4 p.m., I had finally selected a suit and an overcoat. I felt like a new man when I left the store fully togged. Decent clothes are a psycho boost, end quote. Having relaxed his customarily severe Nation of Islam era image, close-cropped, close cropped, clean-shaven, and business-suited, Malcolm had grown out his hair and beard and even posed for photographers uh, in traditional Hausa attire uh, well, in West Africa in May. This was part of a pattern in his iconography of internationalization or the transnationalization of his image. Uh, he had also slightly relaxed his legendary self-discipline, even taking to politely accepting a drink of alcohol on more than one occasion while traveling. In Oxford, uh, Malcolm appeared as just such a new man, fully togged, in a tweedy professorial style that nevertheless confounded the sartorial traditionalism of the Oxford Union. Malcolm's respect for Oxford tradition was such that he was perhaps surprisingly willing to wear the customary tailcoat during his speech. The outgoing union president, Eric Anthony Abrahams, however, had enough investment in Malcolm's sense of style to arrange an exception for his guest. Malcolm also appeared in the straight tie rather than the customary bow. Uh, Malcolm had indeed been gratified by the invitation to speak at the union, traveling across the Atlantic and away from his family for the third time in 1964 to participate in the debate. Oxford had impressed him as something of a decaying idyll. He would tell Guyanese scholar and writer Jan Carew, whose ghost in our blood was the first book-length meditation on Malcolm's visits to Britain, that in Oxford, quote, I felt I'd suddenly backpedaled into Mayflower time. A lovely image on the one hand, but chilling uh, for African Americans recall Malcolm's assertion that we, meaning African Americans, didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. His Oxford appearance is certainly the most remarked upon of his British appearances. Tarek Ali, who was Union treasurer at the time, wrote of Malcolm's time in Oxford uh, that it was, by common agreement, the most brilliant uh, speech to have been heard in that hall for many decades. Abrahams recalls Malcolm X's four days in Oxford as being marked by intellectual engagement with appreciative students, even suggesting that the legendarily ascetic uh, Malcolm found it necessary to resist seduction by an admiring white woman. The invitation to speak at the Union was also a public relations coup uh, for the aspiring transnational uh, pan-Africanist leader at a time when Malcolm's domestic support base and finances were flagging and when Martin Luther King was about to deliver a sermon in St. Paul's Cathedral en route to collecting the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo. Malcolm had criticized Robert L. Haggins, his personal photographer in Harlem since 1960, for duplicating the kinds of images of his oratory that have become iconic. I don't like those pictures, he told Haggins. I am not a monster, and I want you to show me as a human being a term he also employed powerfully and repeatedly in his union speech, the importance of looking upon ourselves and one another as human beings. Perhaps the iconic image of Malcolm from the 15th of May 1963 
It depicts Malcolm at his seemingly most confrontational with fist raised and forefinger gesticulating as if making, as he likely was, an indignant demand for accountability by the state. The image's context, it was taken during a rally in support of Proje Project C, led by Fred Shuttlesworth and Martin Luther King in Birmingham, Alabama, has been flattened in the use of the image on placards, book covers, and shirts as an icon of emergent black power. The photograph of Malcolm warmly smiling, flanked by admiring students, including Abrahams, here, against the backdrop of the Union Library just outside, depicts him in a different and more approachable light at ease and in the position of being admired rather than feared. His speech itself in contains a more inclusive rhetoric than the language of white blue-eyed devils that announced his arrival as a cultural force in the 1959 American television program The Hate That Hate Produced, and that ultimately set the alarmist tone that the British press would inherit. With his criminal record, his advocacy of armed self-defense, if necessary, for African Americans and his comprehensive rejection of Christianity, Malcolm was viewed as a symbol in the British press, even a potential leader of impending race war. Malcolm's reference, which some of you may have caught in the first part of the speech, to a student's comment about looking for your horns, is illustrative. The British press had also given Black power leader Michael, Michael Abdul Malik, the so-called Michael X, the impression that Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam were, quote, more or less a bunch of lunatics, end quote. The realization that Malcolm was no demon, but rather a smiling, supremely confident humanitarian, according to Yan Carew, completely lacking in social pomposity, and demonstrating a total lack of demagogy seems to have emerged as much from the discovery of his personal magnetism and vulnerability as from his rhetoric. Um, Carew described him as possessing an aristocracy of the spirit. Carew go went on to say, he reminded me of a green heart tree in the rainforest and went on to imagine Malcolm's secret nights of crying. Malcolm as was mentioned uh, by the previous speaker, explicitly argued in his speech that one of the tricks of the West is to use or create images in just this way. His theoretical grasp of what he termed in a later speech, the science of imagery, was in fact derived from Elijah Muhammad's teachings on trichnology, or the false knowledge and images disseminated by the dominant culture. In an interview published in Flamingo magazine shortly after his assassination, Malcolm warned, of the psychological and insidious use of the press in distorting black processes of thinking. At the London School of Economics, he would elaborate on the relationship of the image of violence used to criminalize the black Briton, like the African American, and the European-derived negative and hateful image of the African continent and the African people that became a prison, to use his phrase, to the descendants of Africa throughout the world. What became evident too late was that Malcolm X would offer his own life in overturning the orthodoxy of such stereotyping. Malcolm, the former black separatist, surprised his hosts by announcing early in his speech here, belief in the brotherhood of all men. He placed conditions on his inclusivity, however, insisting that I don't believe in brotherhood with anybody who's not ready to practice brotherhood with our people. The implication, of course, was that in spite of the Civil Rights Act, America was not ready, at home or abroad. On the 8th of February, 1965, Malcolm was reported in the West Indian Gazette to have stated that, quote, the citadel of world imperialism is no longer in London, Paris, or Berlin, but in Washington, D.C., end quote. Elsewhere, the historical specter of empire would prove crucial to his characterization of Britain. In a scathing passage in the autobiography of Malcolm X, Malcolm and Alex Haley invoked a hackneyed characterization of imperial Britain before deriding the British elite as outmoded and depraved. America is subsidizing what is left of the prestige and strength of the once mighty Britain. The sun has set forever on that monocled, pith-helmeted resident colonialist, 
Britain's superfluous royalty and nobility now exist by charging tourists to inspect the once baronial castles and by selling memoirs, perfumes, autographs, titles, and even themselves. Malcolm's anti-imperialist sensibility settled upon Britain as a convenient scapegoat allied to America by ancestral crimes and misapprehensions. But he didn't make this the focus of his speech in Oxford. As a traditional intellectual center of empire, Oxford provided a grand stage for enumerating his evolving diasporic politics that united the psychological recuperation of, quote, the black man in the Western Hemisphere in North America, Central America, South America, and in the Caribbean, end quote, with the practical politics of African decolonization, a process well underway at this time. Having just visited the independent nations and former British colonies of Kenya, Ghana, and Nigeria, the once mighty Britain now seemed to Malcolm X comparatively toothless, even in spite of its historical crimes. He did say in his union speech, if you study history. Malcolm was famously an autodidact, educated far from the halls and colleges of Oxford. While imprisoned for his role in a Boston burglary ring, he converted to the Nation of Islam and became versed in canonical literature, and indeed some of his sources were British. The account of his prison reading mentions H.G. Wells as the outline of history. Of Milton's Paradise Lost, he claimed, rather surprisingly, that Milton and Mr. Elijah Muhammad were actually saying the same thing about the devilishness of Europeans. In a passage excised from Alex Haley's Playboy interview with Malcolm, Malcolm went so far as to claim Milton as a black poet, citing as evidence a frontispiece portrait in a book confiscated from the Norfolk Prison Library. Unfortunately, he had forgotten the book's title. Milton was not the only English writer on whom Malcolm set his sights. Sometime after Malcolm's death, Haley claimed that his friend and researcher, George Sims and Malcolm, in conversations at Haley's Greenwich Village home, became bonded in their love for Shakespeare. During these literary discussions, Malcolm's, quote, anger would kind of go away, and he would become more, I guess, malleable from an interviewer's point of view. And after he had talked long enough, I would say, you know, look, fellas, we got to talk about Mr. Malcolm here. And then I would start questioning him, end quote. Malcolm's interest in Shakespeare revealed itself in his union speech, in which he quoted from the first five lines of Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy. The quotation was not simply a nod to his hosts, although he declared in a self-deprecating manner that he had only read about Shakespeare passingly. Malcolm expertly positioned the passage as a discourse on the relative merits of moderate nonviolent protest and potential revolutionary action, as well as a vindication of his long-standing advocacy for African-American self-defense. For Carew, the performance was proof that newspapers had miscast Malcolm as a demagogue, quote, the Malcolm X that the press portrays is hardly one who would quote Shakespeare so aptly, end quote. Although Malcolm would repeat the reference to Hamlet at the Harvard Law School Forum two weeks later, it clearly originated as a case of strategic anglophilia, the Union speech is an example of Malcolm's inimitable ability to tailor his words to his audience, whether in Harlem, uh, Ibadan, or Oxford. In Oxford, Malcolm gained brief access to the British establishment and emerged with his radicalism intact, the rarest of feats. This group photograph captures the fustiness of traditionalism, uh, a traditionalism that Malcolm had customarily shunned, but had invigorated with his polarity 50 years ago today. It also pictures him next to a Scotsman in a kilt for the first and last time. His speech can be said to have filtered into the culture in ways that perpetuate and celebrate his ongoing influence. But our YouTube videos and hip hop albums that sample the speech, agents of meaningful social or political change. Malcolm X left an abundance of mediated images, photographic, filmic, and televisual, also literary in terms of his autobiography and speeches. All of these continue to be reframed and repositioned in what John Edgar Wideman describes as, quote, the bickering over the corpse of a dead man. Who gets the head, the heart, the eyes, the penis, the gold teeth, end quote. The conversation and the contestation continue 50 years on. Thank you.